Thank you so much. How's everybody doing? Everybody's good? Give ABS a round of applause for this amazing, amazing conference. So it's pretty tough coming after the previous panel. I think my co-panelists would agree. So what we um, realized is that it's so beautiful that we had this understanding of the theoretical frameworks that we deal with, and we're going to try to ground it for you a little bit, grappling with how scholars grapple with these concepts as Baha'is and try to put them into our work. As you know, academics is not something that's homogenous. So scholarship and academics can run the gamut, right, with methodologies, ontologies, it's all really different. We tend to come from more applied social science fields, economics, sociology, urban planning, public health. So there's different perspectives and different ways to apply the conceptual framework. So I wanted to put that out at the outset. The other thing I wanted to tell you is this is not Los Angeles. This is Orange County. We like to call it the Orange Curtain. There are 34 cities in Orange County. Did you know that? No. They tend to be on the conservative end of the political spectrum. So often referred to as the red county in a blue state. Orange County, where you're in now, in Garden Grove, is Northern Orange County. I'm an urban planner, I can't help myself. Northern Orange County in the city of Garden Grove actually is home to the ethnic enclave called Little Saigon. We in Southern California are blessed with having the largest Cambodian Vietnamese immigrant population outside of Southeast Asia. So if you venture out a little bit at dinner time, for example, you might find some really awesome food, really good food, and cheap massages. That's also something good to know. Orange County is also the home of the indigenous communities of the Ahashaman, Tongva, and Chumash nations. And as uh, respect for my Ahashaman, Chumash, and Tongva people of this region, I want to thank the ancestors for allowing us to be here today. It is really a delight to be here with you this morning as we grapple with these concepts of self-interest and altruism. As our lovely announcer made, um, already told you, my name is Mojgan Sami. Why am I here? Why are my panelists here? I think the prerequisite was that all of our last names begin with an S, so that all of you can go into the ABS booklet and read our bios really easily, all in, all in the same place. Um, I am working at the intersection of urban planning, public health, and sustainability at the University of California, Irvine, UCI, which I also like to call the University of Confused Intellectuals. <laughs> My esteemed colleagues on the panel here joining me are Dr. Ryan Siegel, who is with Second Muse and an economist that's transitioning to the University of Washington, Dr. Sahar Satarzadeh, a scholar of international educational policy in the Washington DC metropolitan area, and Mr. Navid Sabet, an economist as well, who is working as a researcher with UNESCO in Germany. Again, the details are found in the S section of the ABS booklet. Um, the theme statement for this year's ABS conference states that our common purpose is to develop the capacity to examine the ideas, concepts, and theories operating within the scholarly and professional disciplines, and to contribute to the development of a growing body of knowledge associated with Baha'i thought. The specific purpose of our panel, the way that we conceptualized it, was to critically reflect on the taken for granted assumptions in our disciplines and to, that, that tend to perpetuate a narrow understanding of, uh, of human and institutional reality. So one of those elements of the conceptual framework of human nature. How do we grapple with these assumptions that are rarely challenged in our work? How do we develop individual and collective capacity to challenge these narrow definitions? How can we be part of a vision which calls for a profound change at the level of individual and structures of society? In other words, how can we expand our ontological or assumptions about reality of human and organizational nature? How does the revelation of Baha'u'llah help us 
critically reflect on the multifaceted nature of reality, human nature. This discussion will not be purely theoretical. You'll see that we're going to be grappling with how we do this as social scientists from more of the applied traditions. Um, but hopefully, we can get an understanding that disciplines do this a little differently, and we can apply our conceptual framework in different ways. This has to do with what I call the three musketeers of research. When I teach research at UC Irvine, I actually call my research methods class independent investigation of truth. And the Baha'is in the audience are always like the chickens in a room where the heads go up really fast if they, they hear a noise that they're like, oh, what's that mean? And the reason why I use that framework is because the concept of the seeker is really important in research. The seeker and the qualities that we have, the values that we bring into our work are important. Our conceptual framework of how we look at human nature, ontology, is really connected to our understanding of what knowledge is and the processes of knowledge generation, um, production, reflection, application. I want to give you a little bit of a concrete example from one of my fields of land use planning. Planners assume at the outright that our relationship with the earth is grounded in self-interest. It is assumed that conflict and land disputes are inevitable. Wars over land, water, resources, that's inevitable. So a lot of the training that we give our urban planners, a lot of that training is how to mitigate those conflicts how to go about rezoning if your zoning as a developer is not what you want. As planners, we never challenge the fundamental assumption that land use has been limited to individual self-interest and conflict and adversarial paradigms. So much urban planning training goes to reinforce and perpetuate this model. But the question that critical urban planners ask is, where did we learn that? Who taught us that land use has to be conflictual and adversarial? Who taught us that human land relationships is one of ownership control? When we challenge this basic concept, it creates such innovation. For example, I work with a bunch of engineers, and since there are Persians here, I know there are engineers here. When you challenge the concept of power in engineering, it transforms the way we design. Yes? What I mean by that is usually engineers are taught to have control over the environment, power over the environment. Our structures will have power over the environment. Group of Dutch planners said, huh, what if we switched that up and said we have to have power with the environment? They fundamentally changed the way they designed buildings. Who's heard of biomimicry? Excellent. More of you should hear about this, especially the engineers. Biomimicry is a study of buildings, planning, engineering, design that says a building doesn't have to protect us from nature. It can actually benefit environment. So there are engineers and architects who are building buildings to mimic a tree. Not just climate neutral, but climate beneficial. Not just decreasing greenhouse gases, but actually mitigating them. These innovations happened because of a simple switch of conceptual thinking that power, is, uh, that engineering planning isn't about power over, but power with. Part of the traditional understanding of planning that hasn't been challenged is for, is for good reasons. Okay, they've gotten to the end of their scope of being able to divide toxic uses from, for example, housing uses, and that's a good thing. But the questions now that urban planners in the critical discourses are asking is why does anything have to be toxic at all? Don't we have enough education and knowledge to ensure that we do not contaminate our world? So how can we reimagine these assumptions in a broader perspective? Just that little turn can help us innovate in such different ways. How will this reimagining impact the structures of society? Not just the physical structures, but public policy. The planning culture, for example. 
How will this impact governance, which I'm defining as the relationships in society? Relationships between individuals, between individuals, communities, between institutions, between the United Nations, who, as we heard, just passed the Sustainable Development Goals, 17 of them. How do we incorporate more of the voices of the planet in these discourses? Allowing our fundamental assumptions to emerge from the revelation of Baha'u'llah rather than from our respective disciplines may be a place to start. What do you think? Maybe. For example, we are defining self-interest through the revelation. We are defining it as busying ourselves with our own concerns. This definition from Gleanings is aligned with dominant discourses, for example, in economics, homo economicus, individualism, busying ourselves with our own concerns. Whereas altruism, we're defining through the revelation as a world embracing vision, rather than one confined to our own self. Not a false dichotomy between individuals and the world, a connected, concept of altruism. In fact, the work that I do, it's helped me to be able to talk about the well-being of the planet and the people. A world embracing vision is one that does not distinguish human health from planetary health, for example. However, the definition in scholarship, in social science, is not there. So when we say moving from self-interest to altruism, we're not saying self-interest to altruism in scholarship, but from the revelation of Baha'u'llah. Sahar was kind enough to share an article with me from D'Souza, who defines altruism as the practice of unselfish concern for the well-being of others. Sounds good so far, not so much, wait, wait for it. Practice of unselfish concern for the well-being of others coupled with an associated measure of personal loss. Why? is our fields, why are our fields defining altruism with this cost-benefit, zero-sum dichotomy? So when I was grappling with this, I thought, wow, that's, that's on the way to a world-embracing vision, but we, we have so far to go to get there. The revelation of Baha'u'llah challenges this conceptualization of altruism for us in one that is not embedded in a relationship of us and them. It's not adversarial. A world embracing vision means just that. And not just embracing the person sitting next to you and your family, but the other 6.9999 billion people on the planet. World embracing vision. So at the outset, as Baha'i scholars, we need to remember to expand our conceptualizations of what we mean by altruism. My own research at the nexus of urban planning, public health, and sustainability was greatly impacted by this reimagining of altruism, that altruism, as a latent capacity that is not limited to a cost-benefit ratio. For example, urban planners take it for granted that land is a limited resource that demands control and ownership, as I mentioned. And very importantly in the United States, it includes the right to exclude others. Land use is considered contested terrain at the outset. However, there are scholars that, because I'm looking for it, I find. There are scholars that challenge this. One of them is Dr. Libby Porter, who is a urban planner in Australia. She calls our current land use planning an outdated colonial construct, and in fact, her work shows that the culture of planning and the process of planning has not changed in over 200 years. We're still teaching planners what we taught them in colonial times. Her research with Aborigine communities led to the conclusion that this perspective of planning is maladaptive to the needs and exigencies of our time. The perspective of indigenous communities that she's worked with towards land as our collective mother provides us an opportunity to expand our relationship with the land as more than self-centered, interested, profit-maximizing individuals or countries who wish to exclude others, and gives us a sense of the importance of collective stewardship over the land and a responsibility as our Ahashaman nation, who is local to Orange County states, to heal the land and the water. 
this alternative conceptualization is much more world embracing. It helps me when I find these to articulate things differently in my, in my discourses, in my planning, urban, urban planning, public health discourses. Biologists, oceanographers, ecologists are all pointing to evidence that what happens over here is going to impact you. What happens in Japan and Africa is going to impact the Caribbean. What happens in India and China are going to impact the world. This frame of altruistic land-human relationships has been increasing in discourses of planning, public policy, physical sciences, natural sciences, engineering, even medicine and sociology over the last decade. Nowhere is this world-embracing vision more relevant than in the current discourse of climate change. Climate change has been called by the Lancet and the World Health Organization as the greatest threat to human health in this century. The institutions of the world are increasingly using a resilience framework to address climate change. While most of the institutional response to this is based on self-interest to help communities bounce back, there is a transformational so social movement that's saying no, Resilience actually needs to help us bounce forward, which means we have to put the oneness of humanity as a prerequisite to climate resilience. It's not a Baha'i saying this. These are transformational social movements of climate justice. Very important emerging discourse in the field of urban planning, ecology, climate change. Climate change is forcing us, as scholars, to be more, to be ready to talk about the oneness of humanity in our work as planners, as public health pro professionals. Because what happens in the world, what happens to our entire atmosphere is going to impact all of us. The pivot of altruistic, world-embracing vision then, we can see is the oneness of humanity. So how do we further this Discourse. How do we as Baha'is contribute to this process? I want to turn to my esteemed panelists. Remember, S, 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 so look it up. To grapple with these questions, we've been engaged in kind of an iterative virtual discussion over the last few months. So this is a very organic conversation. It's not like four distinct presentations. We're all kind of, it's all organic, yes? We, um, because of time, we're not going to be able to accept audience questions, but we will all promise to stay here and you can approach us. How's that? Then we can feel like kings and queens up here. That would be great. Uh oh, not self interest, sorry. Altruism. We're all one. So I would like to start with Dr. Siegel in thinking through how the revelation helps us to guide our inquiry into the core theoretical assumptions in economics of individuals in society being self-interested. How does the revelation help guide us? Well, uh, first, thank you for this opportunity to share a few thoughts. Um, a friend of mine had, uh, we, I was talking with a friend of mine, oh, let me put my timer on here. Um, a friend of mine had said, you know, it's, it's interesting that in economics, when we study it, uh, there's a proposition that's typically you study in your early undergraduate courses. By the way, um, how many people here have taken an undergraduate or any economics course? Okay, great. Now, how many of you have an undergraduate degree in economics? Not, not accounting, but economics. So, okay. Wow. Any graduate? Any graduates? Okay, so I only see one hand. <laughs> so I can, uh, there's a couple. Okay, so maybe I can say some things without um, offending people too much. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, but my friend was just telling me, you know, it's interesting that there's, in general, a, a simplified, one of the early models that you, you learn in economics is this notion that if everybody acts out of self-interest, then this sort of this pie is maximized um, for the whole. And he, he just commented to me, he said, you know, something's got to be up with this because all of the religions, actually 
they kind of say the opposite. They say that the organizing principle of our lives should be one of looking after others uh, first. So I thought it was a really simple point, but it's very profound uh, to really think that, okay, so something's up here. Um, I, I, I want to make another prefatory remark, which is that economics is a humongous field, and I'm, I'm not going to do justice to the, to, the, to the field as a whole. It's studied by people, the topic itself is studied by people from different methodological persuasions. Um, and, and even within the discipline of economics, there's a great deal of extensions of core uh, theory, as well as whole other theories using systems dynamics, agent-based modeling, all these kinds of new, new methodologies are being applied to it. So what I want to share today is just a few ideas on uh, standard neoclassical economic theory. As I expected, most of the people in the audience would have experience with some economics, but not have graduate courses. So I was thinking, okay, what can I share that people can relate to? So I'm gonna start using undergraduate sort of models. Um, but the way I'll do this is, is, in terms of how the revelation has guided my own inquiry, is to maybe share some statements from the writings first that maybe speak to one or two concepts then look a little bit at the theory and see what, what insights does it give us. But then it, we can go back to the writings and say maybe it suggests some other ideas that we're going to have to grapple with and that actually many economists are grappling with today. So the first, the first is this aspect of um, transformation. So we, we talk about self-interest to altruism. So I just wanted to read one paragraph there are quotes from the writings sprinkled throughout. So I'm, I'm trying to create kind of a necklace of pearls with the writings sort of put together. So if it's all right with you, I'd like to read this. So the writings illumine our understanding of human nature in relation to self-interest. While it is true that self-love is, is needed into the clay of man, we know that for the sake of God, he can abandon his own peace and profit and will freely consecrate his heart and soul to the common good. Our endeavors should not be spent in promoting our personal interest. We should be generous in our days of plenty, patient in the hour of loss, guard against idleness and sloth, and cling unto that which profiteth mankind. Rather than being busy in our own concerns, we must focus our thoughts on what will rehabilitate the fortunes of mankind and sanctify the hearts and souls of men. This is best accomplished through pure and holy deeds, deeds cleansed from the dust of self and hypocrisy. We must be watchful unless goodly and righteous deeds be performed while actually being prompted by self-interest. Only through the knowledge of God, the love of God, and sincere attention, and a great deal of effort, do such deeds become perfect and complete. So when we look at these quotes as a whole, it suggests that while some part of our nature may have a tendency for uh, selfishness, we can also act for the good of humanity or the community. So the capacity is latent. But we also know that this latent quality can become manifested through effort that we make at the level of thought, intention, and action. And that this can actually be nurtured through education and effort. In other words, humanity is in, in, is in a state of development. It's actually changing over time. Abdu'l-Baha states, among the results of the manifestation of spiritual forces will be that the human world will adapt itself to a new social form. The justice of God will become manifest throughout human affairs and human equality will be universally established. So again, reiterating this point that we're becoming something new. We're in the process of becoming. This might seem like a really simple idea, but it's actually quite profound and has implications for the way that we study social reality. So at a, this is a first comment, is at a high level, in, in standard neoclassical economic models, the approach 
is typically to describe those universal laws and characteristics that describe the operation and functioning of markets and sometimes entire economies. So they begin usually by certain premises, like has been mentioned, I think we're very familiar, of some form of self-interest, at the very least self at the very least self-centeredness, which is a different but related concept. And then kind of build from there. Now, these models are they're very helpful in order to deductively see what are the implication of these premises. That's in fact the power of these standard economic models is they really help us understand the consequences of these assumptions because we can play with them mathematically and see, see what happens. But at a very high level, when we think about this concept that humanity is in a continual state of development into a new social form, it raises two questions for me. The first is how do we study social reality in a way that contributes towards a new social form? And do we know what that new social form should be? So the first question is about the approach, but the second question is about the ideal form that we have in our mind. And this is, this is, um, this is another subtle concept. I, I don't have a word for it, so if somebody knows a better thing, come to me afterwards. But the word I've been using is archetype. That there's some archetype or the ideal social form that we want to be. And so to make this a little bit more concrete in neoclassical model, for example, we can think about the model of the economy, the way that the economy functions through these interactions of self-interested individuals and firms and competitive forces giving rise to some equilibrium. But is that, is that the archetype that we have in our mind? So it, I, think, I think what it does is it, I don't think it means that the, the model is just totally wrong and we throw it out. No, there's some benefit to it, but we just have to, I just have to be conscious, mindful of what are the archetypes that I'm operating within and how do I conceive of the ideal social form? The second concept I wanted to talk about is the way that we acquire wealth. And I'd like to read a statement about it, but I think I might go a little over time. Do you think we have to go? Okay. So again, a statement from the writings. So first it gives us um, insight into why we engage in a profession. Why do we work? Why do we generate wealth? The reason we engage in crafts and professions is to give forth goodly and wondrous fruits that we and others may profit therefrom. The basest of men are they that yield no fruit on earth, while the best of men are they that earn a livelihood by their calling and spend upon themselves and upon their, their kindred for the love of God. Acquiring talents and engaging them in some kind of profession is both for its own sake and for the sake of earning the means of livelihood. But then there's a lot of insight in the writings about how we engage in our profession. So it enables us to increase our physical well-being and provide the body ease and comfort, but we are warned that lest in thinking too earnestly of the things of the body, you forget the things of the soul. For material advantages do not elevate the spirit of man. Perfection in worldly things is a joy to the body of a man, but in no wise does it glorify his soul. Abdul Baha says that while engaging in an occupation is important, he warns that the energies of the heart must not be attached to these things. The soul must not be completely occupied with them. Though the mind is busy, the heart must be attracted towards the kingdom of God in order that the virtues of humanity may be attained from every direction and source. And at the same time, we know that work has been exalted to the rank of worship and is accounted in the sight of God as a goodly deed. But Abdul Baha explains how all these effort, if put forth by man from the fullness of his heart, prompted by the highest motives and the will to do service to humanity is worship. So there's some conditions on, on when, it, when it actually is considered this. So briefly, I mean, we can look at standard labor theory, the way that we think about the supply of, of labor. So the standard economic model is that people are assumed to maximize a, uh, a problem in which they want to 
They want to maximize their benefit from generating money from their work in order to expend it in their leisure time. So there's a tension um, in this model between these two things, between generating wealth and expending it during your leisure time. And then labor, labor supply, which is this curve, you're probably familiar with supply and demand. <laughs> supply is, is uh, the fruit of that problem. Supply represents the minimum acceptable pay that you're willing to accept per hour uh, of labor. So we have to be careful when we critique this at the level of the individual, because an economist would say this is not meant to describe the fullness of a person's decision, and it's not. It's meant to capture the critical details in order to aggregate up and say something about the functioning of markets in general. So there are some useful insights. It helps us understand that there is a, there is a relationship between earning the means of livelihood and expending it. That's true. Um, and the theory actually has the virtue of being very easily extended to, for the person to derive joy or benefit from the work itself, which is another aspect discussed in the writings. But there are some limitations. For example, if to the extent that the theory promotes a way of thinking about work as simply a means to consume, this can be demoralizing. This is a point that's raised in the document Prosperity of Humankind. Also, it, it, the writings raise other questions about the nature of work. For example, if work should be, we should strive to be the source of comfort to souls, and that for our work to be raised to the station of worship, it must be prompted by the highest motives and the will to do service to humanity, how would we describe the pursuit of wealth and profession in our individual lives with these ideas in mind? Another question at the societal level is how does a society need to be structured in order to facilitate that pattern of employment where it's motivated by these, these ideals? Another question that the model doesn't speak to very much is the relationship between the employer and the employee. Actually, what it does say about it is that it's one of, you know, price basically being the mediating factor. But what do the relationships need to be between employing organizations and people to provo promote an environment which cultivates the highest motives? So I realize I'm asking a lot of questions, but this is maybe a flavor of how the revelation has been guiding my, my own inquiry into this. Thank you so much. Um, do you all know that the Dalai Lama was here for three days? And so while the Dalai Lama was here, he made a challenge to all the institutions of education and higher education, and it said, can we cultivate other virtues in our institutions? So one thing that, Ryan, I think that you touched on that's always been a critical question among social scientists and economics is why do we take the values of the market and the individual's relationship with the market and translate that to all relationships? What does it mean if everything becomes a cost-benefit ratio? I mean, we think of you know, romantic relationships that way. You know, uh, I give 50%, how much you give? In? We think of everything as a zero-sum game. So what, what do we give up by only narrowly focusing on the market values as all interactions of relationships, those values put on there. So I think that um, what we're hearing more and more is how do we cultivate those other virtues of higher motivations? So moving a little bit away from economics, <laughs> I would like to go to Sahar and ask how does the revelation guide our inquiry into core theoretical assumptions that underrepresented groups only act out of self-interest? That only, you know, you're, we have these groups pitted against one another that want to vie for control over decisions and resources. How do we, how do we help ha have the revelation help guide us there? It's interesting, just to, can you hear me? Sometimes I'm so loud I can't tell if the mic is on or not. You can hear me? Okay. I wanted to clarify this term, underrepresented groups. What does that mean? And we were going back and forth virtually as Mojgan was talking about, about what label do we want to use, right? So underrepresented groups is a blanketed term of a very heterogeneous group of peoples and communities who have been marginalized, oppressed, systematically, unmethodically, and it could be based on racial, ethnic, you know, minority, affiliation, religious, linguistic, indigeneity, gender, if you're a woman, girl, man, ability, if you have a disability, 
class, and there's also intersections, right, of underrepresented groups. You can be a poor black woman. And so there's these intersections that we have. What is underrepresented groups? And the concept of underrepresented groups is also, it's a social reality of identity. It's not a spiritual reality, we understand that. From the context of the writings, the oneness of humanity, the soul, is our true spiritual reality. But we gotta keep it real. So I'm gonna keep it real, spiritually real and socially real. As Ryan mentioned, we have to apply this, these spiritual tools to look at the social reality in which we live. And so we cannot deny the fact that there is inequity, there is injustice, and there is a large population that is being marginalized because of that. And so wherever you are, underrepresented groups can be called disadvantaged in international human rights. It's vulnerable persons and groups, marginalized, underserved. And then you go to barbaric, uncivilized, which The Guardian refers to as misguided terms. It's interesting because, because of this group that we have created underserved or underrepresented, whatever we want to call this marginalized, oppressed population that has unequal social economic reach, discrimination prejudices ensue. And I wanted to share a statement from The Guardian in Advent of Divine Justice. To discriminate against any race on the ground of its being socially backward, politically immature, and numerically in a minority is a flagrant violation of the spirit that animates the faith of Baha'u'llah. The consciousness of any division or cleavage in its ranks is alien to its very purpose, principles, and ideals. It's interesting because we talk about fragmentation. And we think that, oh, because we have different races, classes, we have different hierarchies, that's reality because that's what we see. What's interesting is it's not only in the writings that this is something that is not considered a reality. I'm not sure if many people are familiar with David Bohm. He's a theoretical physicist. And there's an interesting thing that really caught my attention. I was like, hmm, I need to, I need to check him out more, especially you know, being in sociology. But there's this, this is what he writes and I wanted to share with you. He says, some might say, fragmentation of cities, religions, political systems, conflict in the form of wars, general violence, fratricide, etc., cetera, are the reality. Wholeness is only an ideal toward which we should perhaps strive. He's saying that's what people are thinking or believing. But this is not what is being said here. Rather, what should be said is that wholeness is what is real and that fragmentation is the response of this whole to man's action, guided by illusory perception, which is shaped by fragmentary thought. David Bohm is not a Baha'i, but he gets it. So the social reality is that we have this fragmentation, and the social conditions that exist perpetuate our own actions of self-interest, right? So when we look at this, con this question of how does the revelation guide the role of underrepresented groups and oh, you know, they only, they, the other, only want to help themselves and their communities. They don't care about the rest of us, so why should we try to help them, right? That's something that's very common in the field. So you have these dichotomies that, that emerge. You have the Western versus the non-Western, you have, you know, first world and second world versus third world and fourth world, etc. And it's interesting because it becomes a cycle in which, a perpetual cycle of self-interest. There's the dominant group, which is often attributed in critical scholarship as white from the northern hemisphere, predominantly male, and very wealthy. And so you look at this dichotomy of that, then you go to the underrepresented groups, and you look at the cycle that's being perpetuated. The dominant, the dominant group says, I can serve myself because I am superior to the other, and therefore, I'm gonna keep doing what I need to do. In reaction, 
which is just counterintuitive, but it's a counter nonetheless. The underserved response becomes my oppression, my victimization, is my entitlement to counter and to, to basically address my, my voice and my right to serve myself and my people. We're perpetuating this, this self-interest just through oppression, through inequity, through injustice. It's interesting, in, in the guidance, there's this talk of fraternity, of brotherhood, and it also addresses this issue of altruism. Abdu'l-Baha, in Foundations of World Unity, he talks about four different kinds of brotherhood, of you know, fraternity. There's family association, you know, relationship with family members. The second is patriotism. We come from the same land, and therefore, we are united in that, in that front. The third is racial unity. Racial unity in the sense that we all have the same racial origin, the same origin, so therefore we are one. And the fourth I wanted to share with you in particular, directly from, from the quote. Abdul Baha says, there is a fourth kind of brotherhood, the attitude of man toward humanity itself, the altruistic love of humankind, and recognition of the fundamental human bond. Although this is unlimited, it is nevertheless susceptible to change and destruction. So wait a minute. The altruistic love of humankind and recognition of the fundamental human bond, it's unlimited, but it's still susceptible to change. Even from this universal fraternal bond, the looked for result does not appear. What is the looked for result? Loving kindness among all human creatures and a firm indestructible brotherhood which includes all the divine possibilities and significances in humanity. Therefore, it is evident that fraternity, love and kindness based upon family, native land, race, or an attitude, attitude of altruism are neither sufficient nor permanent, since all of them are limited, restricted, and liable to change and disruption. For in the family there is discord and alienation. Among sons of the same fatherland, Strife and internecine warfare are witnessed. Between those of a given race, hostility and hatred are frequent and even among the altruists. Varying aspects of opinion and lack of unselfish devotion give little promise of permanent and indestructible unity among mankind. So Abdul Baha is saying that we need a spiritual brotherhood that these four forms of fraternity, brotherhood, sisterhood, human, human kind of hood, if we, if we can call it that. Um, he further says, spiritual brotherhood, which is enkindled and established through the breasts of the Holy Spirit, unites nations and removes the cause of warfare and strife. It transforms mankind into the one great family. We must forsake all imitations and promote the reality of the divine teachings. One thing the Guardian says in Adventist of Divine Justice, when we talked about to discriminate against any race is a flagrant violation. He says, there's, he says if any discrimination is at all to be tolerated, it should be discrimination not against, but rather in favor of the minority, be it racial or otherwise. Unlike nations and peoples of the earth, be they of the East or of the West, Democratic or authoritarian, communist or capitalist, whether belonging to the old world or the new, who can either ignore, trample upon, or extirpate the racial, religious, or political minorities within the sphere of their jurisdiction. Every organized community un enlisted under the banner of Baha'u'llah should feel it is to be its first and inescapable, inescapable, you can't escape it, obligation to nurture, encourage, and safeguard every minority belonging to any faith, race, class, or nation within it. The Revelation does not talk about 
underrepresented populations or even dominate the dominant group, focusing on this paradigm of self-interest. Even though it is perpetuated in academe, in social movements, in social services, education, healthcare, governance, etc. What it does talk about is altruism in the sense of what we can do for us. There is no us in them, there's only us. And racial affairs in this country are highly polarized and very sensitive. Not only because social media is revealing a lot of stuff, but the way that racism in itself, the fact that it's permeated the social fabric is actually evolving, as The Guardian has predicted. So I wanted to end with this quote. I don't want to go too much over, but I'm trying to be like Ryan. I'm just messing. Um, I'm not going to go too much. But I can't help but share this example of altruism that I found from The Guardian, in particular, Advent of Divine Justice regarding the role of the white and the role of the black, the black and white Baha'is, the believers, but even just community at large. And I want to end with this because this is what I think an example of true altruism is that defies any notion of self-interest regardless of whatever group or population you come from. Let the white make the supreme effort in their resolve to contribute their share to the solution of this problem. To abandon once and for all their usually inherent and at times subconscious sense of superiority. To correct their tendency towards revealing a patronizing attitude towards the members of the other race. To persuade them through their intimate, spontaneous, and informal association with them of the genuineness of their friendship and the sincerity of their intentions and to master their impatience of any lack of responsiveness on the part of the people who have received for so long a period such grievous and slow healing wounds. This right now is talking to the dominant group, not the underrepresented, right? Now, next, let the Negroes, through a corresponding effort on their part, show by every means in their power and warmth of their response, their readiness to forget the past, and their ability to wipe out every trace of suspicion that may still linger in their hearts and minds. Let neither think that the solution of so vast a problem is a matter that exclusively concerns the other. Altruism is not a fragmented, dichotomous process. And I think that's something that we're trying to reiterate here. And this quote is also very relevant to Native peoples as well. And the situation, the genocide of Indigenous peoples in this country. This concept of trust, of research. It's, there's a lot of distrust in Real quick, I wanted to share. I went to this conference, and a very well-respected scholar, professor, who I have worked with for many years, is very well-known in gender and international development. And they won this fellowship to do research in Liberia, specifically to question and try to transform this whole notion of why there aren't enough women educators in Liberia. And when I found out who was participating in the study, it was all women. It was teachers, administrators, you know, citizens in the community. And at the, end of the, at the end of the presentation, I said, what about the men? Why, how are you involving men into the discourse? And the response was, they're already, they're already represented by default because they are the oppressor. So their voice is already out there. So therefore, we don't need to include them in the study. A few months later, I found out that men were eventually included in the study. But to think that just because there's these dichotomies of oppressor and oppressor, oppressed, I think it's clouding our judgment of what true altruism is in terms of serving the oneness, the justice, and equity that we need. That's all.
I knew you were waiting to do that for all of us, right? Yes. Just checking. Uh huh. <laughs> Just easy. Just easy. Um, something that Sahar mentioned that it got me thinking how much work we have to do to challenge our habits of thought. You know, as individuals, as members, as scholars, as members of a profession, these habits of thought can perpetuate versions of altruism that, again, are not as expansive and mind-blowing as the revelations concepts of altruism are. Um, how this changes the discourses of justice? How does this change the way that we actually analyze social movements? There is a wonderful, I just want to give you an applied uh, example here on, um, there's an organization in Northern California called Social Transformation Project. And they have begun to look at social movements not just through resistance and protest, but how movements are creating new processes, new um, reimagining human nature, community interactions, structures, institutions that will lead to a more peaceful, just, and equitable world. It's fascinating how the revelation is seeping into even studies of social movements, which are often just looking at resistance and disruption, as we heard in the last panel. Thinking about these social movement structures, policy, law, those things are included in these concepts. How do we move from self-interest to altruism, thinking through public policy and law? That helps me transition to Mr. Navid Sabet, asking the question, how does the revelation help guide our inquiry into institutional policy practices that perpetuate, that seem to perpetuate this endless cycle of winners and losers. Sir, pull your microphone closer. We were told that. No. Everyone here? Is it on? Yeah. So thank you for the question. Um, I thought before specifically answering how the revelation might guide our inquiry into these institutional policy practices that seem to perpetuate this endless cycle of winners and losers, it might be helpful to review what some of these practices are. And I think we can do this by looking at both theory and practice. So if we look at practice, I think the issue is quite clear. There, there, there's hardly any policy issue today which doesn't suffer from some sort of deep ideological divide between those who stand to gain or win from a policy and those who stand to lose from it. And I think if you just quickly open a newspaper or, or watch any, any news channel, you'll see the highly polarized debates that are taking place. And I thought just to share a few of them, just to make explicit, um, when you say you know these policy practices are so divisive, what do we actually mean? So a few popular ones. You, you just look at, for example, tax policy. If, if you're a, a Republican or a member of a conservative party, your, your vision of the future is you lower taxes, um, you cut social spending so as to liberate man, to, to enhance human freedoms, to participate freely in the economy. If you're, if you're a Democrat, if you're part of some labor party somewhere, you have the opposite view. You think, well, no, you know, we have to increase taxes, increase the, the role of the state in regulating the economy so as to provide social welfare and equality for, for everyone. And there's this endless debate. If you just watch prime minister's questions, in the UK, you see it's actually divided in half and they, and they bicker every Wednesday for, for 30 minutes. Um, another closely related policy issue is, is what's happening in Europe right now. One of the things that's, that's tearing the social fabric of Europe apart is this deficit problem, this debt problem. So again, depending on which side of the, of the coin you are, you're either in favor of austerity for the creditors or you want, no, you want financial stimulus to kind of stimulate the economy through, through more social spending. And again, I was just looking at the newspaper last week, the, the New York Times, and you see it's e even in the vocabulary of how this is spoken of. Um, it's, a, it's a professor in the University of Athens. He's saying Alex Tsipras is showing that he is able to speak the language of reform and the language of social justice. This is a formula that can turn him into a very important leader in Greece. The winner in all of this will be Tsipras. So you see even, you know, these things have very clearly defined winners and losers. Um, there, are, there are other examples too. If you look at trade, for example, these, these trade rounds that happen in the world, organized by the World Trade Organization, these also have very clear winners and losers. Right now what's happening, this Doha development round, it started in 2001, it's stuck. It's like 14 years later and it's stuck on this very point. The advanced countries, um, are going back on some of the commitments that they gave as part of the Uruguay round, which ended in 1994. They promised the developing countries greater access to 
textiles and agricultural goods in return for the developing countries allowing these things called trips and trims, trade-related investment measures, trade-related intellectual property rights. So the advanced countries got what they wanted, but the developing ones didn't. And so they started this new round in, in Doha, which is stuck exactly on this point. There's this never-ending divide between these winners and these losers. So th th there are other examples. But I think what's interesting to note is that the, the rationale behind many of these policies, many of these institutional practices, is grounded in, in theoretical insights, um, some of which, or, or most of which, are, are economic notions of efficiency. Some of these concepts, not all, but some of them also have as part and parcel of them winners and losers as part of their framework. I think it's been mentioned several times, this idea of a cost-benefit analysis. This is something that has its roots in what's called Caldor-Hicks efficiency. Caldor-Hicks efficiency, and it's used in many policy circles today to, de to help governments decide, you know, do we do X or do we do Y? And its basic assertion is this, that if there's a policy if it increases the net size of the economic pie, it should be done. And then if we want, if we want, we can use the additional economic gains to compensate the losers. That, that's kind of how it works, and it's very unapologetic in its explanation of, of winners and losers. Um, the, the argument's a bit more technical than that, but, but that's basically what it boils down to. And if you look at many, many things, like this Stern report in 2006 on climate change, it was nothing more than a very sophisticated um, cost-benefit analysis, and it continues today. More, more generally, I think what happens with theory is that academics, you know, you're going beyond just notions of efficiency that help decide specific policies. I think in general, what happens is that academics, they look at practice, they, they observe the world, and they generalize it in order to develop their theories. And what happens, I think, is that these theories then cement the notion that there are actually winners and losers, and we get this never-ending cycle of you know, winners and losers being re repeated. And I think, I, just, to, just to share a couple of examples from mainstream theory that, that somehow confirms this view. Um, there's a pair of political scientists in America, Hacker and Pearson. They've written a, a really wonderful book called Winner Take All Politics, and it describes the American landscape and how it's this zero-sum game. And this is what they say. They say the art for policymakers is not to respond to the median voter. It is to minimize the trade-offs when the desires of powerful groups and the desires of voters collide. So you can see that, that theory is beginning to internalize this idea that you know, policy practices always have winners and losers, and the role of our institutions is just to lessen the social impact of that clash when it inevitably takes place. Just to give one other, one other example, um, a, a very prominent example that somehow internalizes this idea that there are winners and losers in policy. It's an influential paper by a political scientist and economist, Darren Achimoglu and James Robinson. It's called Paths to Economic and Social Development, written in 2006. And they provide a really nice theoretical framework to, to provide an explanation of how democracy emerges. <clears throat> and th their framework, it's very simple. I, the, the, theory, the theory is very nice. It's very intuitive and easy to follow. And I just thought to share very briefly some of its elements with you. So they start by saying, look, economic institutions matter in determining the distribution of resources in a society. That's the first element. They say that economic institutions, in turn, are determined by political institutions. Whoever has control of political institutions can, can establish economic institutions to his or her interest. And the third element is conflict. So they say implicit in the notion that political power determines economic institutions is the idea that there are conflicting interests over the distribution of resources and therefore indirectly over the set of economic institutions. So th there's other elements as well, but basically what they say is, look, there's two groups in society, elites and non-elites. They have this never-ending fight until the non-elites gather enough power to pose a credible threat to the elites, and the elites see this credible threat, and they, they give it democracy as a compromise, and so society becomes democratic. So, so now the, the question, and I think it was asked very beautifully last night, you know, given this landscape, given that this is how many policy decisions are made, you know, how do we, how do we interact with that? How do we inquire into these fields of human endeavor that have principles so different to what the revelation contains? 
And, you know, at first, we could be led to believe that, you know, well, we should just dismiss it. You know, conflict and contention are not are not in line with the higher nature of man. So whether or not it exists, in the long run it won't exist, so we can just ignore it. Or, or another way is just to, yeah, just completely um, not take into consideration at all. They're not religious, we don't want to consider it. You know, the faith has all the answers. But I, I'm not sure that that's, that's the way the revelation will guide our inquiry into these fields of human endeavor. And I think the, the examples have been given very beautifully by, by others. I'll just maybe share um, a little bit of what's already been said. But I think this framework is, is really what helps us. And, and Julia was mentioning earlier, it acts as a sort of lens through which we can see the world. And as I was thinking about it, I was thinking about a 3D movie, because I've been sitting on planes a lot the last week, and I've been watching a lot of movies. And uh, I was thinking about a 3D movie. You know, if you go there without the glasses, you still see something. And that something isn't some fictional image that you're, you're making up in a room. You go, you see it, and you describe something that resembles the movie. The point is, when you put the glasses on, what was distorted before becomes very clear. What was, what was confused before becomes less confused. So I think in that way, the revelation helps us um, inquire into these fields. We see the same world that others see. We do see conflict. We, we do see material interests, but somehow the lens of the revelation helps us to see underlying causes and principles, which helps us to go beyond just these explanations which, which very influential social scientists offer. So I guess the, the short answer to the, to the question is, I think the framework is, is how the revelation guides our inquiry into these fields of human endeavor, in particular institutional policy practices. And, and I think, again, many, many examples have been said of, of what this framework is and how it does that, but I could just share just a few more, a few more thoughts with you about this theme. I think the first thing to acknowledge is that whether we're aware or not, everything we do takes place in some sort of a framework. It's, it's not like we think and act in a vacuum. And, you know, the example that helps me think about this is, is, is playing soccer. Um, you know, you can't just play soccer in a vacuum. You, you know, there's a framework. There's, there's a field. There's positions. There's a referee. There's rules. And when those things come together, then you can do all the things that you were trained and practiced to do. So in the same way, you know, we think and act in a framework. There's things that guide our, our thinking and our acting. And the question is, to what degree is our, are the elements of the conceptual framework of the faith guiding our, our thinking and action as opposed to elements adopted by, by society or, or other places. So um, just in terms of now uh, how maybe practically the framework can guide our inquiry, I think the, the talk last night very beautifully gave examples of very concrete elements and how they can, how they can elevate our contributions to discourses and just to follow however humbly th those comments, I thought to, to think further about this framework. You know, it has different elements, and those elements can be organized into different categories. So, for example, our fundamental beliefs about, about the nature of existence would constitute one category of elements. So we believe that man is noble, that we have a dual nature, that God exists, and that God loves us, and because of that love, he guides humanity. So you can see that these elements would really lead to, to perhaps very wildly different policy conclusions than someone who doesn't have those beliefs as part of their, their framework. So the framework gives us clarity as to the purpose of what policy should be. But I think the interesting thing is that this isn't the, these aren't the only elements in our framework, and I think to be effective in inquiring into fields of human endeavor, institutional policy practices or otherwise, it's good to become conversant with a number of elements from a sufficiently diverse range of categories so that we can address issues at the level of depth that they require. Again, it's like going back to this, um, or, or sorry, for example, if all we have to say about the world is that man is spiritual, if that's the only contribution we have, or that you know, there is a God, I think we could find participating in discourses a bit difficult. You know, we could run into a lot of walls very quickly. And I think that's the beauty of the framework. It's different elements don't express themselves uniformly. Depending on the circumstances we're engaged in, different elements will come to the forefront of our thinking, while others will, will kind of hang to the back. 
and, and again, this example of soccer, I think, is, is useful. Forgive me if it's superficial, but, you know, when the ball is in attack, your, your strikers are very active. They, they come to the fore. They're, they're busy. Your defenders are still there. They're not, they're not sitting on the side taking a break. They're, they're still there giving defense, but, you know, the strikers are there. But then when the ball comes back and you're being attacked, then your defenders come to the fore, and, it, and it's, all about, it's all about their activity. So I think in the same way, the elements of the framework have this dynamic interplay that kind of come back and forth that make us flexible, fluid, when we, when we go to discourses, and that we don't show up as this insistent person that always says, you know, God exists, God exists, um, e even though he does. So, so what, what are some of these elements? I think they were explained very, very beautifully last night. So there's other categories. I think one important one as it, come, as it relates to institutional policy practices is the role of knowledge. So, you know, we, we've heard previously that, you know, we believe knowledge comes from science and religion, that these two sources of knowledge are in harmony, and that knowledge is central to social existence. That's a statement of the House of Justice, I believe, in its 2010 Rezwan message. Now, if you think of the gravity of that statement, it's, it's huge. There isn't an economist today who, who, would, who would agree with that. For them, you know, what drives social existence is capital accumulation and technological progress. It's not to say economists don't think knowledge is valuable, they do. But at, in the best of cases, they view it as instrumentally important. So it's, it's important insofar as it drives forward technological advance and capital accumulation, whereas its intrinsic value is not perhaps as great as its instrumental value. So now imagine we're in a policy space and that element comes to the fore, you know, the centrality of knowledge, how that might inform our contributions to a policy decision that's being made about education or, or, or whatever it might be, the centrality of knowledge. You know, other, other categories um, include, you know, fundamental principles like justice and oneness. You know, in, in development economics, there's this somehow, you know, taken for granted belief that there's an intrinsic divide between the global north, the global south, between the poor and the rich, and that the object of policy is to somehow convert the poor into the rich. And I think, again, this is a topic that's been, that's been discussed at length. So our sense of oneness doesn't allow us to, to make those, those false dichotomies, and it guides our inquiry into these fields in, in different ways. So I think, you know, these examples, hopefully what they've shown is that maintaining clarity on the elements of our framework is not such a trivial matter. It's not as easy as just sounding principles might be. So, for example, how confident are we to say that knowledge is what drives social and economic development and not capital accumulation? How able are we to draw on insights from both science and religion to address policy issues? How convinced are we that oneness is intrinsic to creation, and how able are we to correlate the implications of that insight to modern policy discourses? So you, you can see that the elements of the framework really give us a depth um, that help us to inquire into these, into these practices. Thank you. Um, he asked so many questions, it was as though he was the moderator. Just joking. <laughs> um, I know that we don't have much time between you and lunch. I understand that. And I'm wondering, um, we have till 12.30 though, right? Okay, so um, Navi, thank you for calling it fo I mean, soccer and not football. That was very kind of you. <laughs> no, 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 I'm just saying, because you know, in this context, we sometimes confuse football, but I wanna bring another analogy that we often use in academia as a way to think through our governance structures and how adaptive they are and how they meet the needs for today's, today's world, and that's zombie apocalypse. Really, one of the humanity's critiques of the resurgence of zombies and vampires in media is that this happens at a time in society when our systems seem to be dealing with being maladaptive to the needs and exigencies of our world. So the question comes up, what happens if there was a zombie apocalypse? And you realize no one ever tells you that the, how the apocalypse happened, right? We just start the show with it's already happened and zombies are, are there. The questions, if you pay attention to these programs, these movies, these shows, are what kind of world do we want to live in? And I think that's a very important question because what ends up happening in most of the shows is that they repeat what had already been done, right? It's still conflictual, it's still fighting, it's still 
power hierarchy and structures, and how do we change that? Do we want to live in a world that the economic dominant discourses of efficiency, of cost-benefit analysis, guide all of our relationships, or are there other elements of the conceptual framework, for example, values that we can bring to these discourses. And as Navid so eloquently said, this isn't an easy task. So I want to ask my panelists if they can keep their next comments very brief, like three minutes. TK? TK. Um, I want to transition a little bit to thinking about how the revelation, the conceptual framework, helps guide our inquiry into alternative systems. So for example, I'm going to just go one by one and they can all follow one another. How, uh, uh, Dr. Siegel, does our revelation guide into our inquiry of, for example, collaborative economic systems? Uh, Dr. Satarzadeh, how does the revelation guide our understanding of solidarity, different ways to conceptualize solidarity? And Mr. Sabet, how does the revelation guide our inquiry into collective governance? For example, are there um, values or principles in the revelation that might be useful in this regard? And if you don't mind, keep your uh, comments brief. Three, four minutes, please. Yeah, so maybe following the same structure as I shared before, here's a, a brief statement from the writings about uh, wealth. So this is one dimension of an economy, of course, like we said about knowledge. So just how do we conceive of material wealth? So material wealth is commendable provided the entire population is wealthy. In fact, if a few have inordinate riches while the rest are impoverished and no fruit or benefit accrues from that wealth, then it is only a liability to its possessor. Wealth is praiseworthy in the highest degree, but it must be acquired by an individual's own efforts and the grace of God and be expended for philanthropic purposes such as the great undertaking of initiating measures which would universally enrich the masses of the people. In addition, those measures adopted by the individual in generating wealth must serve to enrich the generality of the people. So in, uh, when we look at standard economic theory, again, your undergraduate courses, it's talking about this combination of three forces of self-interest of individuals, self-interest of firms, and competitive forces which yield this maximization of the pie that Navid referred to. And the, the, the model is helpful when a society is dominated by price signals. When that's the way that it primarily organizes itself, it does much to explain that we need to include other costs into the prices. It also highlights the importance of ownership if the world that we live in is primarily driven by price. But the theory is agnostic, for example, about the kinds of things that are being sold. So when we think about a collaborative economic system, we would have to pay some attention to this. It also limits the conception of social welfare to a monetized conception of value. Navid touched on this. So we have to be cautious about using that, that model as an archetype for society. And the quotes raise other questions. Like, if wealth is praiseworthy, if acquired by an individual's own efforts, we might ask how much of our economy is generated by individuals' own efforts. And how much of the wealth that's generated is done in such a way that it enriches the generality of the population rather than impoverishing certain segments of the population? Another question it raises is how do we structure the economy so that the means of generating wealth actually do enrich the generality of the population? If wealth is praiseworthy, if expended for philanthropic purposes, how do, how do we make sure that the way that we expend our wealth, that we even know that it's enriching the masses of the people? So, questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, in response to this concept of solidarity, when we think about solidarity, what does that mean, especially within the context of the revelation? In the social science or the critical discourse context, solidarity a lot of times is affiliated with social movements. And so to look at revelation or to look at social movements from you know, the perspective of revelation, in Century of Light, Universal House of Justice attributes social movements to colonialism and economic exploitation in particular. It's saying economic exploitation fueled colonialism, which is why Naturally, most movements that resulted had a socialist liberal agenda. And so looking at social movements, what are they? How are they characterized? You know, it's a collective body of people who have a common goal, purpose. You know, it's a, it's a 
unified entity of sorts, right? But there's also these contentious aspects attributed to social movements, right? There's contention, there's sometimes civil disobedience, right? Doing things against the law just because, you know, and it's also like fists up. It's a very fists up, very radical kind of perspective when we think about social movements. It's also short term, it's not sustainable. It's sometimes surface level. It's not getting at the core of the issue, it's addressing one particular issue not looking at the root to solve something, but let's challenge this, you know, let's take down, take down the flag, right? Like the recent discourse with the Confederate flag. It's good to take down the flag, which is a distraction of what's the core, what are the core roots of the problem? Is the flag the problem? I think it's way deeper than that, right? So these are also the critiques of what solidarity is in the social reality context. But we are, the universal of justice, and in the writings, it is true that we have this affinity to want to bond with each other, to have this sisterly, brotherly bond, to be in solidarity for constructive social change, right? Not just social change. And universal of justice, in a letter dated December 8th, 1967, says, because our love for our fellow men and anguish at their plight are essential parts of a true Baha'i's life, we are continually drawn to do what we can to help them. It is vitally important that we do so whenever the occasion presents itself, for our actions must say the same thing as our words. But this compassion for our fellows must not be allowed to divert our energies into channels which are ultimately doomed to failure, causing us to neglect the most important and fundamental work of all. And the House concludes that that fundamental purpose is, to, is the spiritual awakening and regeneration of mankind. And so it's interesting that we have this guidance about make sure you, if you want to participate in movements that promote solidarity, make sure they're apolitical. They do not promote, you know, dissension, disunity. But also don't go to the other extreme and say, I'm not going to participate in anything that is relevant, for example, like racial affairs, right, or racial unity. The element of independent investigation of truth is something that I thought was interesting that The Guardian highlights in when you choose to participate in a solidarity movement. And I just wanted to share this. He says, after careful scrutiny, when they feel satisfied is free from every tinge of partisanship and politics and is wholly devoted to the interests of all mankind, then is it okay, you know, to join. So don't be just joining a movement because it's the fad on Facebook or it's something exciting to do, but what do you actually know about what's going on in that movement, right? And lastly, I just wanted to close with this quote from the Universal House of Justice when they wrote to the Baha'is in Iran, the Baha'i students in Iran, about the Baha'i Institute for Higher Education. And I think this is an example of solidarity. It wasn't, it's not only limited to the situation of the case in Iran, right? This has been a, a transnational movement. The House says, call to mind heart-rending episodes in the history of the faith of cruel deceptions wrought against your forebears. It continues. It is only appropriate that you strive to transcend the opposition, not to mirror or reflect it, but to transcend it, against you with that same constructive resilience that characterized their response to the duplicity of their detractors. You too seek to render service to your homeland and to contribute to the renewal of civilization. They responded to the inhumanity of their enemies with patience, calm, resignation, and contentment choosing to meet deception with truthfulness and cruelty with goodwill towards all. You too demonstrate such noble qualities and holding fast to these same principles, you belie the slander pervade against your faith, evoking the admiration of the fair-minded. Hello? Uh, oh, call it, call just it. a few things I wanted to share. I, I hope I can keep it within four minutes. It might go to four and a half, but uh, bear with me. So I, I think it's a, it's, a very, it's a very helpful question. And um, to, to be honest, I don't have a, a, a very crystal clear answer. But I think one thing, um, which again is another element of our framework that can help us um, specifically to acquire into collective governance processes or imagining alternative systems of social, uh, uh, social organization is this idea of being in a learning mode 
And I think that's just so crucial to this area um, of activity that Baha'is are engaged in inquiring into fields of human endeavor. And I, I think it has its, its origins really in the words of Baha'u'llah himself. In, in the gleanings, Baha'u'llah says, Warn, O Salman, the beloved of the one true God, not to view with too critical an eye the sayings and writings of men. Let them rather approach such sayings and writings in a spirit of open-mindedness and loving sympathy. So I think as we try to create alternative you know, systems or, or contribute insights towards the movement of alternative systems, this idea of being in a learning mode, being very open-minded, being very flexible in a, in a mode of conversation and dialogue is, is, is very important. And if you allow, I just wanted to share one example that somehow tries to illustrate all these principles um, or all these ideas that I was sharing earlier is from my experience at grad school. And it's, it's not an experience that ends with like a resounding success, but nonetheless, I thought it was very insightful for me anyway. It was a very, very helpful example. I thought just to share it with you. So during the first year of my, of my program, the OECD came to campus and they sponsored a policy challenge. They wanted a competition of students to help the OECD think about uh, new ways to measure education. The, and this is what the, the, our, our document said. The OECD is aiming to critically review the organization's basic assumptions about development, as well as its ways of working and measuring development in light of new concepts of progress beyond GDP. So I was very excited, and I got selected for this team. There was four of us, and our task was exactly that. How can we help the OECD think about new ways of thinking about development and education beyond uh, just, just GDP. So initially with my team, I tried to <laughs> introduce ideas of moral and spiritual empowerment as they relate to education, because we were for the education directorate. These ideas fell on, on really deaf ears, and so I tried once more a bit harder. It didn't work. So then I said, okay, well, well, well let's put you know, moral spiritual education aside. Let's just work with existing um, theories in education just to see if there's any insights from the field. And if, if you allow, I'll just read briefly from a journal entry that I wrote reflecting on this experience. Um, and I hope just some of the questions that I grappled with might be helpful to others as they, as they, as they carry on these, these sorts of efforts. So in the end, our group created a model. Its basic premise was that education is like any other machine. It requires inputs and it generates outputs. The inputs are uncontrollable. We can't really control, on ethical grounds anyway, the children or youth who enter the educational system. We can, however, change the emphasis and content of education and hence its outcomes. And although we were asked to challenge the basic assumptions of the OECD and to provide suggestions for new types of education, our group simply designed indicators to measure certain social outcomes which it thought were sufficiently distinct from the traditional approach of the OECD to measuring progress in terms of GDP. These outcomes included the six pillars of innovation, social cohesion, environment, political engagement, socioeconomic mobility, and health. What was interesting was to note the OECD's response. The lady was deeply impressed, if not moved, by our work. She even offered our team summer internships on the spot. She said that the ideas, if approved, would be immediately incorporated into a forthcoming flagship publication from the OECD on education, and that our ideas presented, quote, a leap forward in thinking about development beyond just measures in GDP. Needless to say, everyone was caught up in a frenzy, and there I was sitting amongst the crowd feeling a bit drab, but trying my best to act at least somewhat enthused. At one point, she asked, in brainstorming your ideas, did your group come up with non-measurable factors that you considered important, but that you ultimately dropped? I thought here someone would at least acknowledge some of the points raised about moral education empowerment, but the two answers were happiness and self-esteem. I then started to feel whether I was being a bit too rigid with everything. I wondered if I would have been better off from the get-go not mentioning anything about what I really thought and to instead simply go along with the group and help it improve its work. After all, education should help people to achieve better health, to attain greater awareness of their political environment, and to learn how to improve the environment. Although I was certainly not opposed to these ideas, I simply made clear my view that addressing these issues was not deep enough and that we ought to offer real alternatives. Moral education aside, what are the prevalent theories in education? What are their assumptions and are they adequate for the day in which we live? 
Needless to say, these ideas, which seemed to be more of a nuisance for the group rather than a stimulus, were brushed aside quickly. The group was single-minded. It wanted indicators, and it wanted to measure those indicators. Educational theory and curriculum content were considered extraneous. And as it turned out, what our group prepared was exactly what the OECD was looking for. The questions I have then is how does one interact in these situations? Clearly, the aim is not to thrust on others' children's classes or anything like that. How do we work with these entities as they currently are and help them to advance within their existing framework while at the same time learning from them? In this instance, I felt I neither contributed anything useful and the only things I gained were examples of prevalent ways of thinking which could be critically examined for our own benefit. But is this enough? Developing the capacity to bring the revelation into discussions of this nature is very hard. I am learning, but what challenge can be more exciting than this? There's other things, but that's, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. <clears throat> So by way of conclusion, here's what you need to do. Ready? You're going to take notes. Number one, be in a learning mode. Number two, ask questions. Lots of questions. And ask questions maybe differently. Number three, challenge your own assumptions, your discipline's assumptions, and then challenge them through the revelation, through the conceptual framework. Go back to asking questions differently. Finally, ask yourself, where did we learn this? Where did I learn this? Where did my discipline learn this? As a way to end, I want to end with a quote from Abdul Baha about one way to tell if we're actually making progress. It's from Selections from the Writings of Abdul Baha, page 69. Abdul Baha points out, every imperfect soul is self-centered and thinketh only of his own good. But as his thoughts expand a little, he will begin to think of the comfort and welfare of his family. If his ideas widen a little more, his concern will be the felicity of his fellow citizens. And if they still widen, he will be thinking of the glory of his land and his race. But when the ideas and views reach the utmost degree of expansion and attain the stage of perfection, then he will be interested in the exaltation of humankind. He will then be the well-wisher of all lands. This is indicative of perfection. May you all achieve perfection. Thank you.